right. Welcome, everybody. We've got a fun one for you tonight. My name is Jeff Abraham. I am brand manager here at Pyrotechnico, and today I'll also be your host of Wheel of Pyro. Uh, today we're going to be discussing one thing that most companies and people don't like to talk about, and that's our biggest blunders. So for our conversation today, we've got some vets of the road who've got some truly amazing war stories to share with you. I'm really excited to hear uh, what everyone has to say. Uh, these guys have all been at it a really long time. I hope everyone enjoys and learns something from all these stories. Uh, so without any further ado, let me introduce you to this week's three contestants on Wheel of Pyro. With us today, our very own Mr. Bob Ross. Hello, sir. Also with us, Rocco Vital. Did we screw up the countdown or did that work? I thought I had two different times going on. Were we straight there? It's working. Okay. I think it worked. The it delay worked. Okay, good. Yep. And finally, a man who needs no introduction whatsoever, the original, Mr. Michael J. Fox. Gentlemen, good to have you all here with us today. I think we need some new headshots. These ones look a little outdated, but I'll... I'll reach out to your agents and I'll deal with that separately. Uh, in the meantime, Brian, let's go straight into it. Let's spin the wheel and see who's going to go first today on Wheel of Pyro. Feel the tension in the air. Ah, uh, Michael. Oh. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Rocco. All right. So I am up. So, you know, I did some thinking about this and I know we called this thing like the biggest show. So, but I figured I would start this in, in, in like kind of where I started in the business and uh, give you one of those stories. So Perfect. Uh, this must have been 20 years ago, probably. I was living in New Orleans, Louisiana. We, I had just moved there and I had been studying underneath Michael learning Pyrodigital um for years and you know this was my first show that i ever went out and did it by myself i think i had worked a bunch of shows with michael and and others but this was the first one i was doing by myself and i remember this so specifically like we were at this site across the river in mobile alabama and uh we were shooting a fireworks show for a wedding sure. for a very wealthy family in in alabama and uh you know, we'd set it up and, you know, you're on the radio, you're nervous and you get that three, two, one. And if you ever use a pyro digital, there's like a trigger. I clicked it and nothing happened. And I was like, oh my God. Well, then I looked down and the main cable is not plugged in to the show. So I immediately like jack it in and get it going. And then the show starts. And then it's like, I probably ruined these people's experience. You know, they're going to remember this forever. And then, then it starts going through my head of like, oh shit, Michael's going to yell at me. What's Steven going to say? You start going through that brain trash. Well, that was like part one. Part two of it was that the salesperson on this show had sold this show to be an all white fireworks display. So we had gone through our inventory and our magazines and hand selected all these products, silver, white, you know, a little bit of gold was okay. And shows firing and there's it's happening. And then if you ever watched a fireworks show from you're shooting it, like most people see a fireworks show like this, but when you're underneath one, it kind of looks like this, you know, you look up and it kind of comes down at you. And I believe we were using like six inch shells and we launched like a six inch shell and it wasn't like red or anything. I mean, it was just multicolor that just came ripping out of the sky. And I was like, oh no. And I was like, okay, that was probably like, a, and we had like scoured the inventory and all the shelves to make sure they were labeled correctly. And then it happened again. Oh. And then it just kept happening. And I was like, oh my God, I was cursing out our Chinese partners at the time, I believe. Lord. And it was like one of those experiences but I, I would say the learning experience that I got from the cable is to this day, if I'm at a pirate digital, I don't trust that it's even jacked in properly. I have to like force it down into 
the right side of the machine. And that is like the one thing I gather. I never made that mistake again, but that was like the boom, it happened. And it was just like, oh and shit. Great story, I think we've all been there. And that's exactly why we're, we're, we're having this conversation so that we can go into the things that we've, we've learned from this. And you just hit the nail on the head. You'll, you'll never do what again? Yeah, I was like, how do you not, how do you not, and it was like laying right there. And it was like, you go through all your checks and it was like the most important part of it, you just missed. And it was like, oh, well. And it was like, oh no. It was like, what? Because you start scurrying around like, what's going on? Why isn't it working? And so forth. And it was like, and it was like, boom. And that was, yeah. So that's one story I have, but yeah. So who's going next? Who's next? We spinning the wheel again, Brian? That's all right, I'll go. Okay, good. I, I, I just I do want to talk about actually to start at the beginning. I have two examples of do you shoot this show or not? All right, let's not even get into something happening like that. I have two examples. One was in Cleveland for the Cleveland Indians. They'd won the series or won something that year. We were having a parade, and it's the state of Ohio, and it's very, very, it's very, very important the state of Ohio because the fire is is God in the state of Ohio. It's written into the law. It's 1123 as part of the state of Ohio's law. So the we were on top of a building. The fire department wasn't on site. And I have the, the um, I can't, I won't say his name, but anyhow, the event planner was down in the crowd and what it was his problem that the fire department wasn't there because he kept changing the times because the parade kept moving. Okay. So he comes in the radio and says to me, listen, I have the vice mayor of Cleveland here. He'll take all responsibility for everything. Just shoot the show. And I immediately said, that is not going to happen. And he started screaming at me and, you know, everything happened. But the point is, is if I would have shot the show, I'd have lost my license in Ohio as an individual shooter and also could have, could have caused the company to lose the license. And fire backed me up. So, well, yeah. Every, I mean, a lot of people have experienced that before. Is like you get into a jam where I don't. I've been offered money, you yes. know, and it's like you just are in these precarious spots where because everyone's intentions are to go there to create an experience and commit, you know, uh, execute on the promises that you you you've set forth. But that's a tough spot to be in. You know what I mean? It's like, and you, the decision you made is always the right answer. Yeah, it's a licensed state, so it's different, you know? Yeah. And, and We're fortunate a lot of times with our fire departments and our AHJs. They generally have your back. And uh, yeah, yeah I, I'm sure everyone on this, in this meeting and those listening in have had the opportunity, have had the time where they've had to leverage the fire marshal to be the bad guy. Yeah. Right. To help actually, actually where you're at with the client. Yeah, I've done it several times with this same event planner. The same event planner likes to do this. So I've, I've gone to the fire guy beforehand and say, hey, you got to back me up on this. He says, oh, you're absolutely right. I'll take care of this. So don't yeah. ever be afraid to, you know, be friendly with your AHJ. They can be your best friend when it comes right. to, you know, backing you up and saying, no, you're not shooting this. This isn't safe. That's a great point. You know, don't, yeah, don't say it in front of the client, but, but get the fire guy aside and say, listen, I don't feel good with this. Because you, we have to come back to these communities, into yes. these venues, into these areas, and you know, they'll ultimately all the responsibility would land on the license holder and, and the organization. So, true. yeah, yeah. My other example, uh, and then we'll move on to something else. Was in Jacksonville, Florida. This was uh, back in the '80s. All right. Oh wow! Uh, it was uh, it was a big show. It was in Jacksonville. I forget what it was for, and the fog started rolling in. And it was getting foggier and foggier. So it just so happened that actually it was a city event. And the guy, <laughs> the mayor's nephew was the one in charge. And the mayor's nephew was the one that's going to say fire. And I tried, I said, you really want to do this? You're not going to see the shells. He said, no, no, we're going to do this. We're going to do this. We're going to do this. So actually the opening looked great because the opening number was Phantom of the Opera. And the opening thing happening was this 600 foot waterfall off the bridge in Jackson. <laughs> Wow. That didn't create any smoke, did it? Well, but the whole thing looked fantastic because right. it just, you could see the waterfall, the smoke was there, the Phantom of the Opera, it was fantastic. But you didn't see another shell in the show. Not one, not one shell, not even a three inch shell. You couldn't see, the ceiling was so low. 
And yet he told me to fire. And then afterwards, he tried to tell everybody he said not to fire. That reminds me of that time that when we did that show in Da Nang years ago, it was me, <laughs> yes. you, and Doug, and Chris McEwen. And it rained so bad that day of that show. And I'll. <laughs> You guys were the worst on that thing because it was like I was across the river, like watching, and we're ready to do the show. And I see like these three little headlights trickle out out of this container, and it's like you guys walking to the site. I'm like, oh my god, I had no communication with you. It's like, what is going on over there? And I think you were fixing one pin or something like that. Yeah. And yeah. Stuart Bensley was yelling at you. And, yes, he told uh, me I couldn't go out there, and I said, <laughs> if Stuart's on, I said I'm going out there, Stuart. <laughs> yeah fire Dude, me i think he was like the fourth head like chasing the three of you down and then the show shot started firing and it was just like it was like the wind was just drifting right towards us and it was just it was gone no oh, debris was on the crowd tremendously it was yeah it was brutal so yeah. let's move bob? on since yeah bob take a yeah, shot so i got one one this was earlier in my career um you know i was actually just helping out for a weekend in the middle of a crew change up. And I was out on Ozfest back and uh, we were out with Slipknot at the time. And Manson was the, we were the third last act of the night. Manson was the second last. And uh, you know, Jim Digby's out listening to this. He tells the story much better than I do. And uh, obviously Ozzy headlined the show. And uh, so we got Slipknot's down on the downstage edge of the Revolve and we're playing a Revolve. And, Manson setting up on the other half, on the other side of the revolve, and we're getting going. We, you know, the tour's been going on for quite some time, and everyone's got a good working groove. And you know, we had some added some added concussions in the show for a different song that Slipknot was playing. And so here we are, and I'm just hanging back on Firewatch. My job sit under the uh, concussion tank on that day, and you know, get rained on with gaff tape falling on you. And uh, well, sure enough just as these new cues are coming that uh, Manson's um, monitor guy wasn't aware of, he's doing a line check and he's got all the mics up while the concussion hits and sparks blow out of all the speaker cabinets on Manson's set, the cones fall out. And suddenly there we are, we're like four songs away from Manson revolving. And their <laughs> rig is dead, it's smoldering. We got fire extinguishers out and uh, you know, it was a, it was an unfortunate day. I mean, it was a, a bad day to have to call the office and it wasn't, you know, it wasn't something, it wasn't really a, uh, a direct item that anyone wasn't thinking. It just, the day changed, the song list changed that day and you, it just happened to go in a different flow. And, you know, you, you get so used to on shows working routines with different departments that that routine wasn't there. And unfortunately it uh, cost the company a lot of speakers that day. Or a lot of uh, yeah, wow, a lot of amps, I should say. So that was definitely one that was uh, that was probably one of my first ones in my early days of when that show was over, and I was driving gear back, and the rest of the guys continued on the tour, and I uh, you know got called into the principal's office when I got back, and that was one of the first times I had to sit down and yeah you know, take my take my partner or take my beatings for what had happened. Sure. So uh, did you do anything differently now you because of that first? First time, how many times have you uh, had to take your beatings? Ah, well, I, I'm not actually chubby, Paul. I'm just swollen. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's like those types of situations are like, there's like so many different types of like messed up shows. It's like, there's the ones that like something like this happens like that, where like you're just unexpectedly some one thing was different and you know something happened and then the, the downstream is just huge you know there's these times where you go to a show and you everything's like tested at all and then like one minute thing happens and then the rest of it just caves in behind it and you're like what just happened and it's like um and then there's the times you know and i i'd like to hear what you guys have to say about this there's just the time some of them where you just like, they feel like they're going to be a mess when you go into them. You're like, this thing just doesn't feel right. And it's like, you just have this experience. Maybe that's a state thing. And it's like, you just know it's not going to go right. And in, a lot of times, guess what happens? It don't go right. And it's like, I guess, so there's like so many different layers to like a, a what a bad show looks like. And sometimes you, 
you go, and then there's the ones that get messed up and then you try to recreate it afterwards. You can't re recreate it. And it's like, what, what gremlin was there? You oh. know what I mean? Oh yeah. Those are the ones that, uh, those ones will drive you crazy on gear when you bring it all back and you can't re can't recreate the problem that you had with the equipment. Right. Um, I had it's... one experience we had, uh, working with a good friend of mine, Kevin Hughes, and we had this one propane unit. It would just keep faulting the system and we couldn't figure it out. And it was probably two weeks later, we were dealing with something in the pressure switch of the accumulator tank. And we found this little tiny, tiny set screw that had fallen out of a terminal that nobody had seen and it had arced on the back of the wire. And it was just, you know, one day it bounced in the truck and you'd show up in Seattle and it worked. And another day it bounced in the truck and it'd show up and it didn't work. And we, it took us forever to figure it out. But certainly, uh, there's always, there's so many times that we have moments where we learn from too. Michael, any yeah. Oh, go ahead, Rocco. No, no, no. I was just agreeing with what Bob said is just that, yeah, you just, it's all about learning. And then the ones that scratch your head is the ones where you just don't, you you that would sound like a very minute thing right there in the end bob but it was like um created big pro small thing created a big problem you know what i mean absolutely so. yeah barges are always fun too whenever you have a barge that always adds into the to the joy some of yeah, the yeah uh, I, I think that is an additional layer to a fireworks display yes. that is just it adds a level of skill a level of complexity that i, I doesn't you're you're right. It, it 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 does change the game. It's always in some for some reason. I always seem to have some good things happen in Philly, Paul and barges. <laughs> and I knew Paul, where this is going. <laughs> Paul, Paul, Paul will know this. Uh, uh, one of my first things that the funniest thing. And this had nothing to do with the show. We're coming back from the show in Philly. We had shot the show. We're coming down, and I suspected that the, the captain had been enjoying some tipple. Sure. <laughs> Because all of a sudden he comes on the loudspeaker and says, we're going to hit the bridge. We're going to hit the bridge. So we're going right for a piling with these barges. And I can't believe he missed it by centimeters of running into a bridge. It's crazy. It's uh, he yeah. that for you, that's Bob. a helpless. Yeah. That's a helpless feeling. Who was now, it in our crew that was on the barge one time that snapped loose? Was that Lib? uh i forget who on a fourth of july show i yeah. thought that yeah i think it was lib i've been i've been floating once or twice <laughs> yeah, yeah we, we, we do a, we do a show in marietta where the barge gets spuds spudded down and the spuds let loose and there was nobody holding us so we're floating down the river and we had to get rescued quickly and uh i remember newport news one time this is this is again the show was the show was shot Actually, no, we were shooting the show with, with Boom Boom. We were shooting the show with Boom Boom, all right? And all of a sudden, the boom, when it came time finale, the Boom Boom stopped working. So I ran out with a flare to light the finale by hand. And wow. I still, the guy was still on the board trying to push the buttons. And it got to the point where I'd reach up and grab the fuse cap to pull it off to light it by hand, and he'd ignite it, it'd go right in my face. <laughs> <laughs> and they just kept doing that the whole way down the finale, which was kind of, I mean, it was me, so it didn't matter, but it was a little crazy. <laughs> so, and, and we did obviously Bible learn from that, and we do not do uh, <laughs> hand fires on a barge. We don't hand fire when there's electric going on. Right, that, right. That was different. Th that was probably, what, 20 years ago? Yeah, it was a different time, Paul. That was back when I wanted to remind everybody, that was back when you 200 foot was the maximum separation you needed for a 12-inch shell. You know, our industry sure has come a long yes. way for good reasons. Yes. And it has. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, yeah. I mean, there's the fireworks, just the safety distance aspect of everything was like, um, what used to happen versus what happens now is just, um, so most yeah, people can't crazy. even imagine that, that you can shoot. I shot 12s, 200 foot in the middle of a city in the middle of Philly again, Paul. The way Natchitoches, to, Louisiana. Remember, there was yes. that like little hill there, and yes. like, there used to be like you shoot twelves, and there was houses right there. It and it crazy. was legal because it was two hundred foot total for any shell you had. So, right. so Rocco, I know our uh, our viewers on today dialed in to hear up hear about some blunders. I I see a picture in the background behind Ooh. you. Uh, I Base pod. 
this was before I joined Pyrotechnico. I remember watching yeah. it on the news that day. So base pod what Let's base pod part. was I mean base pod was I have to say it was it was quite an interesting experience to say the least. Um I'll just lay it out there. So the fire at the base pod happened at like, you know, if anybody knows about EDC or has been to EDC, this was when it was in June, when it was brutally hot out. And, and so the, the EDC runs from about six o'clock at night or seven o'clock at night to six o'clock the next morning and or seven the next morning. So it is long and it is, it is, it is, it, it, it's quite an experience uh, to, to be a part of. And, and sadly, you know, EDC was supposed to be happening this weekend. And, um, you know, that was one of the reasons I put the base pod picture up. We were going to be in Vegas this weekend. But things have changed. And, you know, we're looking to be there in October. But, um, you know, so I was with Steven. And it was like 4.30 in the morning. And we left. We had left. Like, like hey, let's, you know, it was like an hour and a half left of the show. We'd been there a long, long time. Like, let's go. So we're driving down whatever it was either 15 or whatever the boulevard that runs up on the other side of the speedway was and we got a phone call steven got a phone call and it was miranda and we turned around and went back and uh so we had went and it was like oh no and then we we went over there and the thing about the base pod fire was that you know we get over there clark county fire department was like and between Clark County Fire Department, our crew, and Insomniac, it was the way that was orchestrated to get those kids out of that area, to get them clear, and to – those kids were back dancing again within about an hour and a half. Um, and there was just a cohesive group effort. No one – it wasn't maliciously done. It's just like – a guy from Insomniac told me once, he's like, after it happened, he's like, when you play with fire, sometimes that's what you get. And uh, the one funny thing about it is I remember I was smoking at the time and like, I was just like, and the stage manager came over. He's like, put that cigarette out right now. He's like, the last thing I need the fire department to do is see you smoking right now. I'm like, okay, fair point. Um, but it happened and Clark County Fire Department was, was, was great throughout the whole thing. And, um, you know, great as they could have been considering the circumstances. And I looked at like the, I always look at the base pod fire as a moment. I would say that was a moment in our evolution as an organization where we, we put in, we really took action after that. And, you know, Paul was a big part of that. And, you know, Paul's day-to-day -day operations as our director of safety at EDC is he, he we, we put a full-time, you know, safety compliance person out there. Paul would put a team with Paul and he goes around every stage after the crew leaves for the night and, and make sure everything is still safe and make sure that never would have happened or might not have happened. Actually, I don't want to say never, but might not have happened without the base pod fire. So you look at things like the base pod fire and they happen and, you know, and a couple more points about the base pod fire that I'll, I'll let you guys talk was, is that, um it's still in our existence it's still miranda's screensaver on her computer i think and um and and it, i think it's a good reminder for us that you, you know you gotta you gotta make sure you, you you have good process with your tech any of your gear and you know how you function equipment and you're making sure your technicians have the right training and all for so i think it was a it was a good learning experience for us it was it didn't feel that great in the moment and uh I'll never came forget. Out better, came out better and was stronger. Came out after. Yeah, I, and I, I will leave names out of this, Bob. But there was a there's a production manager who works a part of that show who's pretty big production manager in the industry. Um, I received an email from him. Like, I had been gone off site. It was like four days later, and I had been gone off site, and I had received an email at like eleven. I don't know why I checked my email at like eleven thirty at night. And all the email said was, 
are you awake? And if you are, call me in all caps. And there was nothing in the body of the email. And you know who I'm talking about. You've worked with this individual before on a lot of projects. And that is probably the scariest email you will ever get in your life as, as working in the production world. And I made that phone call and I learned a lot that night. <laughs> oh, with, with that being said, it, I mean, the base pod, I think a lot of people learned, a lot of companies, a lot of individuals, a lot of groups learned. That, that whole thing was a bunch of different things that piled up onto it. Uh, I want to make sure that you know, a lot of good things came out of that, not just, not just us changing. The, the industry as a whole took a look at things, and, and things were changed after that. Yeah, and it was like – the funny part about it was is like, you know, the following year, you know, they made it a part of their design on the base pod. That was always a thing that made us chuckle. And uh, I think there's actually T-shirts that exist that – somebody made the there's these base pod t-shirts that are out there and uh it was a part of insomniac's uh promo video for the following edc so it was you know took a bad situation and made it uh a lot of good come from it it was a, a lot of times it was a gift and the, that was a gift to us as weird as that sounds so it's kind of the general theme i think here is making a lemonade out of lemon so yeah no that was a great point thank you Rocco yeah oh, oh anything ever else? ending improvement yeah yeah how about you Michael what are some other well, fun moments? I still don't want to get off the barge yet okay. <laughs> oh no no, no no we're still gonna one thing let me go back to that the, what I just the one I just told you about with the lighting the finale that show was almost doomed to begin with because we left part of the show in Newcastle Oh, and we had know, to rush in it the, down in the magazine in the magazine in S3. We had to rush it down to, to, to the, the show. We got it there. We got all that up. But after the, and also during that show, we detonated a 12 inch, a 12 inch detonated and went through the barge. So the mortar was down in the barge and it was a massive hole in the barge. So it just went down and it went off. Actually the shell, when the lift went, the shell, went down through the barge and then went off in the barge. Oh, the man. lift, the lift put it down <laughs> through. So now we've got this big gaping hole in this barge. So I tell everybody to stay away from it. And, and the one, the one crew member, uh, Tommy, we just call him Tommy was, uh, <laughs> didn't have proper footwear on. He had like loafers on and he promptly walks up, slips in the sand and falls down in the barge. <laughs> So now I've got a guy down in the barge. Also, there's shells floating down in there in the water. All right, so I got a guy down in there. So I jump down in there and go swimming, not diving, swimming. I'm a big diver, so I was ready, but I just had to swim. So I went down and made sure he, we, he was all right, but we had to get the fire department to come on the barge to pull him out. It was, it was not a fun, that was not a fun show at all. Oh my gosh, there's nothing fun about any of that. No, but but then the things always going back to Philly, Philly and barges. I don't know, Paul. I guess it's where you're from. <laughs> I don't know. Um, this was Mr. Libertor, Mr. Chris Libertor was with me on this show. We we did a show in Philly. It was it, it was a barge, and it was one of the first ones we you know it was an early early in the you know in our company's history. And I was on a barge, and I had zero people that had ever been in a barge before, and hardly anybody had ever been in a show before. And none of them knew Power Digital. It was me. All right. And we're leaving and where we're loaded and we're going steaming down towards Philly. And I'm testing and I shoot a 12 in the middle of the day. <laughs> a 12 inch shell lifts about after we're about 50 feet. We were under a bridge. 50 feet is all it missed by. Or else the thing when a shot went up, come down on the deck. Okay. So this thing shoots. So uh, I'm looking for shorts and stuff. We get down, we start the show. All of a sudden, it, everything starts stopping. Everything's quitting. And it's obviously a short, but it's time for me to leave the board to go look for the short and nobody else would know what to do with that. So what I did, anybody that knows Pyro Digital, you'll probably like this. I just kept switching from board to board. And when the circuit breaker would pop out, I'd hold it in with my finger as long as I could to get that board to fire. And then when that board quit firing, I'd pop it another board and do the same thing. 
And then as each board quit, I'd keep running from board to board because the circuit breaker would cool down. How long did that last for? Uh, the show, the whole show. Now, a lot of shit didn't go, but shit did go. I've never, <laughs> I've ne I've never had a show that didn't get something. Right. But I, I have. Yeah. Go ahead, Paul. We, we, yeah, we've go ahead, the Paul. Policy, all, all because of this. New Year's Eve in Delaware, on top of a rooftop. Hold the first yep. test fire. Everything went fine. Okay. Countdown hit. Pulled the trigger to shoot the show at midnight. Nothing. Went through, tried to do what, everything that we possibly could. We end up finding out right at that exact moment the controller went dead. Pyrotech, you know, you know, yeah. always looking at what we've done in the past and, and making improvements on it. We now require every smart system ah. to have a backup on it for that reason. That's right, Paul. I forgot Holding about that. that trigger or not a damn... So, no, okay, I did have one thing go. I had the test shell. But, but other than the test shell, the show did not go. You, know, it, yeah. that, you want to talk about a, a crappy feeling when, when, when you have all those people on New Year's ready for this show and nothing. Oh, and is that and not? Then, then it was raining on top of a rooftop, so you know that even made it better for the crew. Oh, forget about how about that walk? That walk of shame back to the client. So there's Lib. Oh, okay. yeah. All yeah. I know is. Yes. Oh, All I know is what, what I've heard is don't ever put that guy on a barge. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like trouble. Yet, because he's yet to tell, I'm sure you're going to come on here and tell the story about the one in the island. The, the, that, that's a legendary one as well. All I know is what, what I've heard is don't ever put that guy on. Oh, yeah. Well, I know going back to the, the Bard show, Michael, one of the, I think it was, couldn't have been, but the third show I'd ever been on. And I remember for that whole year, I remember just those from Michael, because Michael was, was yelling, the breakers kept popping on the PD panel and all he kept and you have to hold it for like 10 seconds for it to reset. And all we were doing was pulling the cable. And I could just remember Michael going, hold it, Lib, hold it, Lib, hold the, hold the breaker, Lib. And he just kept screaming that at me repeatedly. And then he would switch the cable. And then as soon as you'd switch the cable, boom, you know, one, <laughs> and, then, and then, the, then the breaker would pop. You'd get about 18 seconds, breaker would pop. And then, you're, you know, we'd switch and you got your thumb on. You know, I just permanent indentation in my thumb from that. But, um, yeah, the, uh, the, Saint, the, the, the island show barge was certainly uh, an interesting one. I, I wish I could say it was earlier in my career. and It was actually more recent than that. So, it was last, last year. Yeah, it was last year. We've been doing these shows down there forever, and the customer had, you know, you know, we all know that fireworks shows on barges can always be a little, you know, you don't always get these dream barges, right? And uh, we had a pl platform, which was, it was fairly sound, it, no longer, but it was sound at the time. But um, no longer. We, we, uh, we were shooting the larger shells from this platform that we had anchored a few hundred feet off of the island that we were shooting uh, uh, some of the lower level stuff off of, and that's where we controlled it. And, and we swagged a cable to this platform a few hundred feet off. And um, show shot, everything was fine. We were all congregating. Those who were on the little island, it was, it was a, only a handful of people were on the little, little island, the, the smaller island off of the big island. And I remember somebody just said, you know, hey, there's a little something sparking out there or, or a little flame. And it was pitch black because, you know, it was just the open, the open, uh, you know, See? grip in there. And, and we look. And I said, okay, well, let's jump over on the dinghy. And, and one of uh, our customer's brother had like a small inflatable dinghy. And, um, and we, we walked to the other side, this little island, a sandbar, you could call it. it, was only 500 feet across. So we walked to the other side of it and, and we turned the corner. And I mean, it couldn't have been seven minutes time from the, the time this thing, and this barge is fully engulfed at this point. And, and I mean, fully engulfed. And so oh, I remember seeing a picture of it that night. I was like, oh my God, what is that? Uh, Tony, that looks expensive, I said. <laughs> oh, so Tony, Tony's like 78 years old and Tony's driving the dinghy, former, you know, uh, uh, he's a veteran and, and, you know, and he's, he's 
flying past the barge and then he's like go under the seat there's a pump there's a pump you know and it's like one of the, it's like a siphon pump you know a foot pedal pump to like pump water out of the boat and so we're like we have no fire extinguisher with us we just jumped in the dinghy and went around and and so the fire extinguisher was oh there it is yeah so the fire, <laughs> the fire thank you Paul. The fire extinguishers were were on were on the barge you know with the idea that you know you approach it and we can extinguish anything and so like we're doing drive-bys like spitting on the barge and then you know then it's we realized there was obviously some shells left over and you know five detonates so you have a flaming barge with uh you know uh, shells detonating and i remember calling our cfo mark and I like have him on FaceTime and like in the background and you know, he's like laying in bed. He's like, what is going on? He just sees a, a full barge in golf and I'm on a dinghy just doing yeah. runs back. And forth. I remember seeing, get, having that picture sent. It was a Friday night. I don't know why I remember that, but it was like, you know, you kind of lose track of what shows you have sometimes that night. Like, what in the world is this? And it's like, I think Doug Aller said it to me. I'm like, what is that? He's like, that's Lib's barge right now. I'm like, oh, that's, that's great. I like to. Well, I have a, I have a, I have a story that I know you were involved in that makes me laugh because I it, we had not been we were not working together at the time. Oh, I, it's the famous Chicago. No, I don't know. Maybe it was the one where I saw an Instagram. You were doing an awards show, and Mr. Hellebrand hit the wrong confetti cue at rehearsals and totally engulfed a performer. Oh. <laughs> oh, oh man, that was like something I'd never seen before. Oh, that was, that was an interesting, you know, I've been fortunate. I've spent a lot of my showtime in award shows and uh, that is, isn't even the one I was going to tell today, but that was a, uh, you know, we were using the artistry emotion AV controller, you know, you got two buttons and you know, on that show, Troll was, uh, you know, had to be unpatched and wheel around because the way the setup was with the video screens, we different acts, we had to have different firing positions. So we just kind of had cables certain places. And that was, you know, spike marks for the controller goes here for this act. It had to be over by this wall for that act just to keep the sight lines. And, uh, you know, when we were scurrying, you know, the, the most fun with an award show is the adrenaline rush of you have a commercial to set it up. And so, you know, you're scurrying away and, plug it together and uh you know there we go and it's supposed to be this raining it was for florida well it was florida georgia lines confetti because it was separated by the state colors right and another act that was supposed to have streamers launch out and there we are and we got this other act up on stage and we accidentally you florida georgia line and we just pelt like 20 pounds of tissue down on the whole band that's just sitting there thinking that Streamers were going to go out the downstage edge. And, uh, yes. But uh, Drew, Drew Taggart got hammered on well, that one. Yeah, I do. There is my favorite of award shows, though. And I, I promised Keith Hellebrand, who's listening today, that I'd tell I've him. I've already apologized to him on the Facebook chat. So he's, he, he's, he's good. <laughs> good. He, uh, you know, we were doing a, a hip hop award show. And it was the end of the night, last performance. Yeah. Won't give you the specific artist name, but if you had ten, if you had five dimes in your pocket and added them up, you could figure it out. <laughs> and uh, you know, sure enough, it was a you know it was another one of those moments where you're you know you're in rehearsals, cues are changing, so this was just in rehearsal, and you're soft patching on the or you're patching on the DMX console and in between these dry runs, and didn't get the DMX plugged in and. This artist was very particular about their fog. And we have the last run of the night. You know, we're already two minutes after the labor call. The stage manager is shutting it down. Uh, you know, the building steward is shutting it down. We're past labor time. Well, the fog didn't happen. And next thing you know, I'm coming out. And uh, before you know it, this artist comes over to me and he grabs my shirt and reads the company name on the shirt. And then he's got me in like a throat like he's got his hands around my neck <laughs> and he's like you with xyz company he's like where's my fog i'm like apologize sir i'll get this fixed for it i want to see the fog now and before you know it i just like you know he's got his hands around me i see keith hellebrand running over and uh, another great mentor i had 
Lorenzo, he's running over. We got this artist posse coming over. The stage managers in Union, they're already walking away because, you know, call time's over. And I'm like, I'll have it fixed tomorrow. And it was just, I, again, I was younger in my career. And it was quite an intense moment. I had never thought I'd get choked out in that kind of manner. <laughs> <laughs> in the middle of for a, for a, for a cold fog queue <laughs> and and like that's back when it was at the kodak theater like in this prestigious beautiful theater and here i am getting choked out on downstage right and uh <laughs> it was certainly certainly an experience i'll tell you i am very paused i am very redundant when it comes to confirming my cables back in my controller yeah i mean those are the learning lessons that you that you uh you walk away with and it's like no what is you know don't you don't ever i forget how the, some, i think steven says it a lot you know like don't don't use a bad oper a bad thing as look at it as an opportunity yeah, you know absolutely. and well, you, you know you gotta learn right yeah you gotta learn and i think that that's you know i think for us to you know we're having some fun here and for us to be able to come on and talk about these things is like you know I believe that the reason why we are vulnerable in sharing all these experiences is because um, we know that um, we're going to do something with them and not just, you know, stick our head in the sand and, and move on in life. So. Oh, and I mean, it's the, uh, you know, the thing is what some of the blunders we might think of the audience would never know. Right. I uh, just, you know, and that's so many people I've had the privilege to work with over the years have such dedication and pride in what they do. And so proud of their, their trade and their skill set. I mean, how many times, you know, I sit there and, you know, when I'm like entering into a different country and they say, what do you do? Say, I'm a pyrotechnician. That's such a unique casting of a job or direction of a career. And like I said, you've had, I've had so the pleasure to work with so many passionate people and professionals out there that they have such high standards that a blunder to them is never recognized by the audience. And uh, except when it's like two gerbs and a gerb waterfall, you always know when you always know when you, right. miss, when you got a gap going on, but uh, yeah, the, uh, they just hold to high standards. It's always been a, uh, been an interesting, been an interesting journey, man, for sure. For sure. Paul, any cool. questions we want to take that have come in? There's really not many questions. A lot, lot of comments, a lot of uh, people thanking Michael for uh, training them, taking them through the, the, the ropes. A lot of people a little, uh, I wouldn't say upset, but they got Keith's back. They're not happy with you, Rock, for <laughs> throwing them under the bus. <laughs> hey, at least I owned it and apologized. Yes, See, yeah. I, the way I worked it is I figured like this is like, I think we're on a lag, right? And like, so I typed that in. He was probably like, what's going on? What's going to happen? And then all of a sudden, we just started hammering him. So he was ready for it, I think. Keith, I love you. Hey, and, Keith uh, had my back when I was getting choked out. He was ready for it. <laughs> right. He didn't miss a beat. Hey, looking at Chris Lib, we had an interesting thing happen. Chris, do you remember Life in Color at the stadium? Oh, boy. And uh, no, what it was is, uh, you know, the stage, it was all, the cues are being all called by the stage manager. So I was on the board and he was calling the cues. Well, in the middle of the show, the stage, they fired the stage manager in the middle of the show. Oh, wow. <laughs> in the middle of the show, they said, he's gone. And somebody else got on and started calling cues. They had no, no clue. Remember that, Chris Lim? I do. I actually think it was <laughs> Ioki got in a fight yes. with the yes. stage manager and they had to break it up backstage. And, uh, and then he got fired. And I remember having to walk into the trailer and ask the customer, I'm like, uh, since uh, stage manager's out, you know, who's calling the cues? We just need a little direction here for the next artist. And they go, what do you mean the stage manager's gone? I said, he was just escorted off property and the whole trailer cleared and they ran out. And um, I think Calvin Harris was coming up next. Yeah. Nobody knew what to fire. But it was uh, crazy. And I lost my cure in the middle of the show. Now when you, yeah. That, that reminds me, we, uh, when I, we used to do a lot out of uh, Bollywood type shows back in Toronto, and uh, back then you back then you're using uh, if any of you remember the sequential the PP two the six output PP two Lunatech controller, and they use yeah. the uh, the little twenty four module or twenty four circuit module units, and 
you'd have to, you'd have all the cues written down on a piece of paper and your client beside you and you'd be you'd be like okay we want a, a comic cue and like, okay here we go comic cue and with the translation we couldn't you know we didn't couldn't follow the music didn't really know when it was going to be except for you know a tap from the client and i remember working this show and Client's like, okay, I want a jerk cue. We get a cue. And finally we're at the end. He's like, so what do you got left? I'm like, or we got we got purple mines and a waterfall. He's like, hit the waterfall, ready, set, go. Boom. Turn off the waterfall, not the waterfall. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh shoot. <laughs> but, That's uh, hilarious. You know, and I just add one more thing. And um, you know, sometimes we talk about Michael will know this one as well is like sometimes when you 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 get shocked that um something you just go sometimes you're in a situation where like you feel like this there's no way this is going to work and it all it all works and the reason the, the example I have of that is every Thanksgiving weekend for I don't know six seven years Michael and I and Doug and a Chris McEwen and some others, we used to do this big show in Shreveport, Louisiana. Remember, Michael? Oh, Rockets yeah. over the rat. And there was a barge, which Michael was on, back to the barges. And then there was this huge bridge that we used to do. And when I tell you, it rained the day of that show like I had never seen rain before. And this client was adamant about having this show that night. And they were dead set on it. And uh, it was an anniversary year, I believe. There was no rain date for it. Um, and I mean, it was like, there was like, it felt like that there was like layers of water on top of the cakes. Just like, it was like, it was crazy. And you, was. Have all this you have all this electronics laid out, you know what I mean? With, with the firing modules and cables and everything. There was just exposure points all over the place. And the show, I vividly remember this, was like at eight, 35 I believe it shot and I, I was on the shore running audio Michael was shooting the barge Doug was shooting the bridge and there was a set piece about <laughs> like that went like for the anniversary number 20 or 10 whatever I don't remember what that was and I remember like going on the radio rocket a Doug rocket a Doug five minutes till Five minutes till go. Where are you at? And he just came barking over the radio and language I won't use here. <laughs> Shut the beep up. I'm hanging this beep and set piece. I'll be ready in five minutes. And it was like, all right. I told the client, okay, a couple minutes here. They're just finishing, you know. Um, and we shot that show and it worked. It was like one of the, like, I expected like there to start and then all of a sudden dead shorts all over the place and it just stopped working or like it would start and stop or just be sloppy all over the place. And it was one of those shows that it was like, I, I can't believe that just happened and it just worked. So, you know, it was like, uh, yeah, it's like one you thought was going to be screwed up ended up going great and it was crazy that it happened. Yeah. yeah set piece thing at Donzie's one time in Pittsburgh, we never got the set piece up. So what I did is when the cue came, Ralph was in the board. He said, Q, I picked it up and held it. <laughs> Again, a learning experience. <laughs> do as I say, not as I do, Paul. <laughs> you know, and, and I think one thing that, Michael, you'll be, you'll be, you'll get a little left at this one. We were at a meeting this morning and, Liv made the comment that we need to break out the boat parade shows again <laughs> in Florida and then proceeded to tell the story of what a boat parade looked like. And I was like, oh my God. So Liv, you can, Paul, you might want to. Earmuffs it, Paul, yeah. Earmuff it, Paul. But the boat parade stories were legendary. Yeah, this was like, this was 2010, end of the year. I had just moved to Florida to begin working full time. And Michael happened to be down there in like November and he's, I was there like a week and Michael's like, Hey, why don't you come down? We'll get you on a show down here. We'll get you on the boat parade show. And, um, and, and, and Boca Raton. And, uh, and I, I said, you know, just assuming this would be just any traditional show. And I remember showing up to this park and there's this, I don't know, 60 by 30 foot barge. And the strangest things were on the barge that I just wouldn't have imagined after 10 years of shooting shows. And, 
you know, there's like a low boy dumpster in one corner, all very strategically placed. There's like a water dunk tank, like you'd see at a carnival, like a four by four water tank. I'm like, what could this be? And then, you know, there's a container that's got some type of makeshift door installed, like a restaurant swinging door. So they like opened the container doors and then built a wall with a regular man door that would swing both ways. And you go in and there's an ungodly amount of cakes and candles, and anything you imagine. And then there's these like shooter stand. There's like, these tables that look like little personal working desks. And, um, and then, you know, we had like the show eating and you start to realize what's going to happen here. And, and, you know, we're going to lead this barge down the intercoastal and, and shoot the show, you know, and this thing moving down. And, and you had, you could sign up for like one of three roles. You were either a hand fire guy, you were either a dunker of the, of the, of the fired product into the water tank, you know, or, or, you know, you were a runner uh, in and out of the container of the swinging door. And, uh, I do wish to this day we had video of it because I mean, it felt like you were in the movie Saving Private Ryan pretty much because, you know, you would just, you would just like run in and Michael and, and, and Chris Raitano are just yelling at you to move faster and you'd throw it down and they would launch it. And then when it was done, you know, some guy would come in like an artillery guy would come in and reload it, throw it in the dunk tank. You're soaking wet from the water and then, you know, throw it in the dumpster. Um, and, and all meanwhile, the barge guys radio and I can't see, I can't see, you know, smoke is billowing up and you get some millionaire from a deck or a patio that's screaming. And then, you know, you, you know, you start to feel like you have some control over everybody's emotions. So you start ripping a bunch of stuff for that guy and that family starts screaming at you, you know, you feel like the star of the show. It was undoubtedly the hardest physical three hours that I had experienced to date. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, no one was, uh. And no one was injured in the process, and, and many were entertained. But uh, and so, we've and we've changed a ton since then. Yeah, we certainly raised the standards uh, in respect, and, and can't say we've done any boat parades anytime recently. So. Paul, you're, you're not gonna... missing an. Paul, we appreciate you not missing an opportunity to tell you how much tell everyone how much we've improved. Hey, you know that's that's my job. I got to make sure we're improving, and that's why we're that's here right. to talk about it. That's exactly gotta... right. And I... good. No, it's exactly right. It's, it's, you know, we have all been on this, you know, I, you know, I, you know, to talk a little bit about what we do every day. I know there's a lot of people on here who um, are part of the organization and some that aren't, you know, and it's just like, I think that Steven has just instilled this constant never ending improvement mindset that trickles all the way down through the organization and um i i don't believe if we if we didn't have that we probably wouldn't be so comfortable talking about this and uh you know what i mean and and, and bob i have to say I'll, I'll i'll single you out is like we've been working together for two years and uh a lot of the knowledge base that you brought um has been a big part of that as well and uh you know, and, and I think we can all look here. I know myself and Lib and, and, and Paul can say of all the stuff that we've learned from, from Michael. So it's, it's, you know, uh, our, our, I always say we got a hell of a story and uh, the story's only going to get better. Even though a lot of us are hurting right now, I think the story's only going to get better. So. Absolutely. I got a couple quick questions that we've seen that I think we're going to get close to wrapping up. I just want to make sure we address them. A couple questions on training. Um, Bob, this one I'm going to bounce towards you because you'd be able to help out a lot on, on it in, in some respects is they're, they're from Canada and they want to tr come down to uh, U.S. to train. What, what, what direction can you uh, offer them in that? That's a good, good question. I mean, generally, uh, you know, pre-COVID, working with Pyrotechnica, we have a number of our shooter schools could have been a great opportunity. Obviously, in the world, we're a little paused right now, but if that individual would like to send their email address would be more than happy to reach out to them and talk about some opportunities that could be out there and areas of direction I could send them to. Very good. And another question is about uh, when, when's our next technical training going to be? I, I will say that we, we do have one in the books. We, we have a couple fine tunings to do. Uh, it will be either next Wednesday or, or uh, maybe the week after. We'll see. Uh, we're having a few technical problems that we're still going to work through but we will put it out within the next couple of days to let everybody know exactly what it is we'll share it on 
on all, all of our social media uh, that we have. I would just the- add to that as well is, is that, you know, Brian and Jeff and Paul, you guys have ran those technical trainings with Marcel and they've been in awesome. And, uh, you know, I've been myself and, and, and Steven and some others behind the scenes have been kind of under, understanding what we're going to do. I, I would ask people who are watching this, if you have ideas for us, please share them. You know what I mean? So we don't have all the answers here. We don't know what people are looking for. So um, we'd be happy. No idea. It's a bad idea with us. And, you know, if you have thoughts, you know, you can send it to us on a message. You can tweet, you know, info at hiretechnico.com. You can hit us up on Facebook. You know, we're, we're, uh, we're willing to look at anything. Yeah, I was going to say, Rocco, to that point, we'll also be sharing another survey. So if you guys would give your feedback, we'd greatly appreciate that because we're trying to make these better and better and more and more engaging. So we really do appreciate all of your feedback. Yeah. yeah. And I'd have to, uh, anyone happens to uh, have the interest in Happy Fireworks with Bob Ross episode, maybe, <laughs> there's, maybe there's a light humored one. I'll, I'll pull out the easel and some paintbrushes and I like that a lot. Get myself a pet squirrel and a, and a <laughs> uh, yeah. and just, just in wrapping up my end, I, I just, everybody should remember that, you know, we talk about all these crazy things, but, but it is a learning experience and you do learn by making mistakes. Yeah. And it Don't does make you better. Them. Don't waste them. It's like, I, there's, a ton of people who are following along right here who are in this business. Some people do this for us and some people don't and do it for others, but just don't waste them, you know, because if you waste them, if you don't look at them as like a gift, as I keep saying, then you, you, you could have learned something. That's a great point. I think that's really what's the point of today. So let's, let's end it there. We could be telling stories for hours, but I appreciate everyone, all of you guys joining and taking the time to tell these stories. This is awesome. I'd like to do this again. Everyone else out there, keep your eyes posted. We will be having announcements coming out in the very near future for webinars next week. Rocco, do you have something else? Yeah. I just wanted to add a couple quick things. There's, you know, you know, we going through this experience that we're all going through with, you know, the COVID-19 stuff, you know, um, there's a lot of good stuff coming out about the industry. Like, uh, Bobby, you might be able to add a little bit to it. You know, Michael Strickland from bandit lights, you know, sent out the, there was a letter published yesterday. Um, you know, there's a lot of people in the, uh, the sentiment is like, they don't know about our industry and, and it, it's going to take a, a, a movement to happen with a bunch of people to, for, for people to understand what, what I believe the number was 10 million people are going through right now. And, uh, and so forth. And, I, and on a fireworks front, you know, the American Pyrotechnics Association is, is, is doing great work on making sure there's awareness that, you know, Fourth of July shows are, are, are some are happening, some aren't. And, that, you know, we need to celebrate our country's independence. So that's all I got. No, thanks very much, Rocco. I think you said it really well. You know, it, it is a challenging time for our industry, and I think, you know, so many of us are watching as different, following different states and their reopening plans. Mass gatherings are, are very low. You know, they're in the, always at the bottom lines of the, of the final phase of a reopening, which for so many of us that have had this great opportunity to build a career in this industry, it's uh, definitely challenging to see. You know, it, it leaves us with a lot of unknowns. Nobody knows when it's going to be. So No. But it will be. That's the thing. Like, uh, it will be because, you know, if anyone hasn't seen it, go check out Dave Grohl's article that he wrote for the Atlantic the other day. There will be shows. Yeah. It's going to be more important than ever, I think. So, with that, yep. thank you all very much, and we'll, we'll see you next time. Take care, everyone. Later. Stay cool, safe. Be safe. Bye, everyone.